I, I really like trying to make this time interactive. Um, in fact, uh, I, I, yeah, we just, there's a lot of interaction. So the so way I, I generally teach this class is, it's generally during a Sunday school hour, um, but we, I have lesson numbers and then we laugh because lesson two might actually be like five weeks, lesson three might be two weeks, because there's a lot of conversation. People have questions, things come up, and there's particular issues of importance that uh, you may get through a whole lesson on the doctrine of the Bible, and it's all, it's all review. It's all stuff you know. There's really no extra stuff you might get to um, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, and all of a sudden something's butting up against something that's been niggling at your mind, and there's, <laughs> and there's a 30-minute conversation about, about that, and that's kind of where you know, and I, I like to leave, uh, the, thing I, the thing I appreciate about teaching classes like this is leaving that flexibility, leaving that ability to, to flex a little bit. And so we'll see how far we get, and then we'll pick up um, next week, and we'll go from there. So we began this, um, the Doctrine of the Word, last time we were here, and I believe we made it as far as the canon, um, which is in your notes down at the bottom of page one, uh, Roman numeral number one down there. I think that's where we left off. And if, if, you want, if you need to fill in the earlier blanks or get some context, I believe that the last session was recorded, and you can go back on the, the church Facebook page and find it, or uh, Don can tell you where, where to, locate, to locate that. So we're going to actually pick up there uh, because there's some really important stuff I want to get to. So as we talk about, <clears throat> we're talking about the importance of the Word of God. And, and, and I think most of us look at, at this that we bring in here every Sunday morning, or if you look at it on, on a device or tablet or what have you, and we realize that this is the inerrant, inspired, perfect, infallible Word of God. But, the, but that raises background questions because there, there has been pushback. There's been challenges of which writings then represent God's authoritative revelation. In other words, if we ever found the third letter, letter to the Church of Corinth, would that be canonical? Would we add to the canon of Scripture? Because it's, it's pretty clear from Paul's writings that he wrote a third letter, possibly a fourth letter, to the Church of Corinth, and I think all of us understand that Paul wrote things that didn't make it into the Bible. Like he, you know, I mean, everything from grocery lists to there may have been letters to churches that just didn't make it into Scripture because they weren't inspired. Um, and so, so how do we how do we do that? And so we have this word, uh, and that's your your first blank there, Roman numeral number one, is the canon, and it's C A N O N, and that word just simply means a measuring reed or rule um, of Scripture. It's and it's it's this the canon. It comes from this idea of what is the standard. Inherent in the discussion are, there's, there's a number of questions here. So, first of all, how did we get 66 books? You know, because if you, you know, if you, if you listen to the, uh, the latest History Channel show or PBS, you know, there were backroom deals, you, Council of Nicaea, and, and either they're deciding on this one being out and this one, this one does this, and the Gospel of Thomas really would have made it in except for this, and then there was a deal made to, to get that out if you, you know, if you watch... Um, uh, the Da Vinci Code, you know, read that book, you know, and now all of a sudden every, everything gets tossed on its head and you have a completely different picture of Christianity than what is represented in the Bible that we have. But there are more theological questions as well. What's the relationship between canon and authority, which came first? Some people will argue that the church decided which books were authoritative. We would argue that the church recognized which books were authoritative. And those, those are two very different statements because the second that the church is authorizing the Bible is the second that the church becomes the judge and authority over the scriptures. And that's what you have with the Roman Catholic Church, is this idea that the, the church is the final arbiter of what is authoritative and what is not. In our case, we would argue that the church, the early church, recognized the, the legitimacy and truth of the scriptures and the authority of the scriptures and placed itself under them. And that's, that's two completely different models that um, kind of uh, what Dave mentioned this morning about the whole cornerstone idea. If you start off two inches off, or you start a little bit off, like by the end, you could be, you can actually be way off. You know, I think of, um, I read once a white paper on the, and I don't really understand physics really well, so I didn't understand a lot of this, but I remember reading a white paper once on the physics of getting a rocket to the moon because we were getting ready to watch um, the Hidden Figures movie, the women who helped, you know, put the, put, you know, and just how, if your math is off by just, it doesn't take much, <laughs> but, but like half a degree or you know, a minuscule amount at the very beginning, by the time you get from here to there, you're not even in the same like solar system. <laughs> here. So it, there has to be accuracy <clears throat> and precision. And so we begin with the canon of Scripture, uh, because as soon as we affirm the authority of Scripture, that raises the question of which writings represent God's authoritative words. Okay? And so we're going to start with um, letter A, the Old Testament canon. And this is kind of the easier one, um, the Old Testament canon. So the Old Testament is generally divided into three, three 
kind of general subjects. What, what are those? The Old Testament. How is the Old Testament divided? So Jesus refers to this in Luke 24, 44. Actually, why don't we just have someone read that for us? Can someone grab? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah. So we we would we would definitely recognize the Pentateuch. Um, the Jewish culture today recognizes the Pentateuch, but for for the day for the Jews of Jesus' day, um, no, I have the uh, no idea. Let's see here. No, I have the wrong. Do I have the right text there? Yes, I do. Yeah. Okay. So, could someone read um, Luke twenty four forty four for us, nice and loud? Okay, so what, what threefold division of the Old Testament canon do we have there from Jesus? Okay, the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms, which oftentimes were used to represent what we would today refer to as the wisdom, the wisdom literature. And, and so we have, we have they, even there, they understood there's this, there's this, this division here. Um, and though these books were written in different places at different times, and the Old Testament obviously was written over a much longer period of time than, than the New Testament. The New Testament we can kind of smush down into, if you take James is roughly 40 to 45, and Revelation is like 90 to 95. You're still talking about roughly a 50-year period that the entire New Testament is composed. Uh, the Old Testament, you know, depending on when Moses put pen to paper um, for the Pentateuch, you've got a pretty long, you know, pretty long span <clears throat> of history there. And so <clears throat> in Judaism, a recognition grew really early that the books all belong together and constituted God's verbal revelation to his people. We really don't see a, a lot of debate over the Old Testament canon. That's just, there's not, that, that's really not even a, a strong conversation today. The, Jew, the people of Jesus' day accepted the Old Testament canon as these, this was the authoritative word of God. Uh, Wayne Grudem observed that Jesus and the New Testament authors quote various parts of the Old Testament scriptures as divinely authoritative over 295 times, but not once do they cite any statement from the books of the Apocrypha or any other writings as having divine authority? So there's, there are times where they might cite a source outside of Scripture, but not with divine authority. There's, there's no point where the New Testament authors are giving kind of that, that, um, that level of authority to other books that have been written. So you see like um, Paul quoting uh, is it Enoch or... I can't remember who he quotes. But you know, the, using outside sources but not putting them to the level of the Old Testament, not really citing them as authoritative, really citing them as, as reference points for things that they want to cover. Um, now, the Jews had other books, of course. They had commentaries on biblical books. They still to this day, but they're never referred to as scripture. Um, they're never referred to as the very words of God. And so obviously some of these books, uh, known as the Apocrypha, were bound alongside the Greek translation of the Old Testament many hundreds of years later in the 4th century AD, which we see with you know, the Greek translation, of, which is the Septuagint, um, which, which was, you know, the, the Bible of Jesus' day. But even then, early Christians didn't treat these books as scripture, but rather as inspirational, devotional writing. So any questions on the Old Testament canon? There's not a ton there that I wanted to cover. I, I feel like most people, it, when the challenge comes oftentimes with the New Testament, with the Gospels, and, you know, you even have Martin Luther fighting with the church on, on James and, and some other things like that. But any, any other thoughts or questions there? And honestly, I'm, I'm trying to move through. Go ahead, Sean. Yeah, I, so, so oftentimes the challenges to the Old Testament come with dating and authorship. Um, so the, the challenges, so, so say like to the book of Isaiah. Uh, I, I even had a seminary professor at a very conservative um, fundamentalist seminary who argued that Isaiah was put together by multiple editors over a long period of time, and that some of the writings in Isaiah were actually post the time that they took, that they were writing of, and that's so that's the big accusation to the Old Testament is especially some of the prophetic writings is that that um, more progressive critics will argue that they weren't actually written by the person who who authorship is attributed to, and they were written far later, so they look as if they're predicting something when they're in actuality not, and that's that's more with the Old Testament where I see I I, I don't there's not a ton of 
like conservative leaning scholars who are arguing for different, um, like a different canon in the Old Testament, things like that. It's, it's just, um, I mean, obviously the biggest challenge in the Old Testament is there are a lot of books in the Old Testament that we simply don't know who wrote them. You know, it, it's, there's, you know, they're anonymous, but, but we have such a long history of Jewish tradition of accepting them really un, unbroken going back that we don't really have, you know, it's not really a struggle for us. It's more just, well, we just don't, we just don't know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and then every now and then you'll have a weird thing. I remember a, um, a professor, we had to read his commentary on, we were reading on Job for one of my Hebrew uh, syntax classes in seminary. And we were translating certain parts of, of the book of Job. And along that, we were reading a, a technical analysis of the, of the text. And the author was an author at a, again, a conservative evangelical school in Ohio. And he, he was arguing that Job was not a literal historical person that Job was a metaphor and it wasn't a real, a real person. Uh, and I, while, while there, there could be good scholars that argue that, to me, that, that doesn't, the way the Hebrew is written in Job, whoever is writing Job believes he's writing about a real person. There was a man in the land of Nob. Like, there, there, it's not, it doesn't carry the stereotypic Jewish idea of, of someone an anonymous character. There was a person, that there was this random, you know, and, and the way that Jesus kind of, you know, cites and quotes, I, I think that there's, it, I, in, my, in my mind, you have to have some pretty strong evidence to say that Job is not a real historical human being, but, but there are those who, even in very conservative um, circles, would argue that. And, and they're probably smarter than I am, so I may be wrong. But, <laughs> but I think as we found out throughout history, um, IQ level does not necessarily automatically equate to uh, practical wisdom in the, accepting the text. Otherwise, our universities would be filled with Bible scholars instead of people who hate the scriptures. Um, so there, <laughs> there is that. Anything else on the Old Testament before we move to the New Testament canon? All right, so letter B is the New Testament canon, and that's the top of your next, your next page. So what we see, and this is, again, this goes back to your history channels, your Da Vinci Code, your... Um, PBS documentary, and there's some things on PBS that I love. My wife and I are kind of um, PBS masterpiece junkies. Uh, there's a lot of shows we enjoy there, but but as soon as you get into like their nonfiction or anything they do on theology, you're you're basically looking at it going, do I want to raise my blood pressure or do I want to you know <laughs> like you're you're asking to to have to to to, to have to really um, take things with a major grain of salt, you know, and they, they have commentaries on that. And as soon as they have, you know, as soon as someone on is, you know, as soon as they bring in an expert like Bart Ehrman, you're like, all right, we, we know where this is going. We know that this is not, this is not going anywhere close to the biblical text. So some writers give the false impression that the church took an exceedingly long time to recognize the authority of the New Testament document. Some, some will point to the Council of Carthage, Council of Carthage um, in 397, and they'll say it's 397, so 400 years after the life of Christ, roughly 400 years. This is when the church finally decided that, that we had a Bible um, about which books were in and which were out. But it's important to note the distinction between recognizing the authority of a book and drawing up a list that includes the book. So we think of like in 367, uh, what, was, what was come to be known as the 39th Paschal Level of Athanasius contained an exact list of the 27 New Testament books that we have today. And he wasn't, he wasn't giving them authority. He was acknowledging that this is the list. This is the list we're working with. This is, this is what we believe to be authoritative. So the, the challenge really there has been, at what point did we want, we want to know when this came out, right? Like we're, we're Western. We think, we think in certain categories for for years, this was 27 separate letters that eventually some got attached to each other because they were you know localized over here and, and over here and sent you know sent to churches over here. But you know Ephesians, Galatians, Philippians, Colossians, they, they, these are four different scrolls, four different parchments that are being circulated in different places and copied and copied, and then eventually you know they they get to put them into this book. But this, I mean, this is expensive. Like we take this, we take this so much for granted, right? We, I mean, if, if probably representing in this room, if you're here for a Sunday night Bible study, you probably have multiple of these in your home, different versions, different copies. You might have the giant like family Bible that you never look at except to write your next family tree list in because it's it's impractical, right? The thing takes up your entire coffee table, you know? And so to even open it, it might fall apart for one. Um, but, but you've got that down to your little, like what I call your daggers, you know, that you slip in your back pocket so you can go up, you know, sneak up on people with them. Um, 
and, and your little Psalms and Proverbs and, and you know, and everything in between. Like this is my this is my preaching Bible, but but I haven't I don't know that I've ever used this for my personal devotions because I'm a I'm a highlighter guy. Like I'm you know I'm I'm like working through a different Bible each year and, and highlighting and marking and writing and then and then picking a new one because I, you know that one's all marked up and I want, <laughs> I want to jump over to a different one, a different translation, a different version. And and the challenge is we forget that for much of human history, this was a luxury. Like to have this in your hands, like all put together, bound for a personal use, not chained to a pulpit in a in a church. This this was a real a real luxury, and so so that creates some some of the, some challenge there is figuring out when exactly did, did this all come together. But it's simply bad history to say that the early Christians had a vast variety of creative beliefs and whole bookshelves full of alternate gospel and texts because that's. That's sometimes where you hear, right, is there were 55 different Gospels at the Council of Nicaea or Carth, Carthage or what have you, and they, they selected, and, and it's just not, it is kind of bad history. Um, as one uh, uh, Greg Gilbert said, he said, the only Christian writings that have been confidently dated to the first century are the books of the New Testament themselves. Um, so yeah, you have, you have these other writings, but not one of them has been accurately dated back to the first century, oftentimes. So you, if you read through some of them, whether you're reading the Apocrypha and comparing it with the Old Testament, or you're reading, you know, say, the Gospel of Thomas or the Gospel of Judas, or, and read compared to the New Testament, immediately, if you're familiar with reading and reading and reading this, you begin to notice differences, right? There's differences of theology. There's differences of writing style. It just doesn't, it just doesn't fit. We, when I was in, in, in seminary, we had to read several books of the Apocrypha. And after reading through the, the prophets and then reading Bell and the Dragon, you're like, this just doesn't, like, it, it doesn't work. It doesn't, something, <laughs> like, and, and you hate to say it, it, it's, it's all down to, it just doesn't work, but it doesn't fit the overall flow of the rest of the, of the, rest of the text. But there's a ton of other reasons as well, and we're going we're gonna to keep moving with, with some of those. Um, it is true, and we, we need to be clear on this, that there were a few leaders debating about a few books. What were some of the New Testament books that, that early Christian leaders struggled with, and why? James, why? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, you know, Martin Luther famously called it a right straw epistle. You know, he's like, he put it at the end. He, he, didn't, he didn't take it out of his list of New Testament books, but he put it at the end, and he put the, um, so as he, as he annotated the, the list, he put, I can't remember how he did it, but he put, the, he, he like sub, I think he like sub bulleted it under the book above it to, to indicate that while he was grudgingly keeping it in the canon, Martin Luther, I think in his pendulum swing against Rome, you know, he's like, here's Romans. Romans opens up Martin Luther's eyes to the world of salvation, grace through faith. And here's this book that seems to only talk about works. And in Martin Luther's mind, like, I'm just not, I can't, <laughs> I can't. He's always struggled. What's another book in the New Testament that, that people struggled with? What's the, what's the one New Testament book that we really, really struggle with authorship of? Hebrews, right? So, the New, so, so black people struggle with Hebrews. Why? Because we don't know who the author is. There was, there was a, a certain period of time where it was, it was consistently argued it was Paul, but the Greek of Hebrews, it really doesn't fit Pauline authorship. And he may have written it. He may, I mean, people change their writing styles. It's just not, it's not, we make it to heaven and find out Paul wrote it, or we make it to heaven and find out that, that Barnabas wrote it, or you know, whoever, you know, Priscilla. Like, we, we, we really don't know. Um, and that's, you know, it is an anonymous letter. And so people struggle with that because one of the things they were looking for was who wrote it. Were they an apostle or were they connected to an apostle in some way that would provide authority to the, to the letter? So they struggled with, with Hebrews. Um, they struggled with Jude. Jude was a letter they, they struggled with. Uh, and then Revelation. Why would people struggle with Revelation? Yeah, <laughs> the, whole, the whole book is crazy. <laughs> like we've got dragons and babies and and like stars and and cosmic battles and it just didn't like it was. And and it, remember a time when apocryphal literature was becoming kind of popular. People were writing apocalypses, like you know. And and it, the, here's this apocalyptic letter to churches, and and people are reading it, going, I, I don't. And then how do you interpret it? And, and that, that's played out to today, right? Um, as, a, as, a, you know, as, a, as a progressive dispensationalist, I look at it very carefully um, as, as being played out in, in history and a, much of it future, uh, the, the things that were, the things that are, the things that will be. But you think of someone like, someone respected scholars like R.C. Sproul, um, who argue that it's basically all been 
fulfilled except for like the last two chapters, right? And then, and these are guys who we would read and listen to and enjoy and be blessed by in many of their, their areas. But Revelation has kind of provided that, man, that's a, that's a bugaboo for how do, <laughs> how do we figure that one out? And these aren't heretics. You know, they're not arguing it's not in the Bible, but they're looking at Revelation and going, uh, yeah, I don't, <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. And, and then I think on the other end, sometimes we get into some of the, we over, like, you know, I grew up in the, the type of church that had charts for everything, right? So here's like the chart. And, you know, we had a pastor every other week who knew what the mark of the beast was going to be. And, and all the technology he talked about back then is so outdated now that there's, there's no way it's actually that. And, and you're just like, maybe we need to stop with that, with a speculative theology and, and just, just focus on, <laughs> focus on what the text actually, actually tells us here. But even these questions, questions over slightly different themes and emphases, but compared to unbiblical books, which were roundly rejected without much controversy, these books were by and large accepted around the Christian world. Uh, in fact, uh, when someone asks, how do you know that the Gospels in the Bible are the oldest, most original documents, and that the other Gospels weren't all destroyed in some devious political conspiracy, there, there are really two basic responses, and these are, these are not from me. Um, these are from the author of the, of the notes. He said, I have two, two basic responses. First, early believers cared very much about the truth, and they defended in their letters why the books of the New Testament were authoritative. These guys had lots of theological differences, and they came from different parts of the world, but we don't see them arguing for the inclusion of the Gnostic Gospels, right? We, we see schisms beginning to form. We see differences of interpretation. We see differences of view on church polity and ecclesiology, but, but they're all going back to battling over the text, Right? Kind of like us, you know, as, as someone who, who is more Calvinistic in my soteriology, going to a, someone who is more Arminian in their soteriology, we're both going back to the text. This is what we're arguing from. We're not arguing from two different canons. He's not going back to, well, well I'm going to go to the Gospel of, of Penelope, and I'm going to go to the Gospel of Wilbur over here, and we're going you know, to argue. No, we're, we're, we're both going here, and we're seeing different things, and one of us is right and one of us is wrong. Um, but we're, we're, we're both acknowledging that this is the authority. We're just, one of us is broken in our understanding of, of how it applies in that given particular situation. But then secondly, he says, I'll ask this person if they've ever actually read any of these alternate texts. I'd encourage you to do that. Many of them are available for free online. You can find a lot of the alternate gospels. And um, I, I think if you, if you just, if, many of them are very short. They're not, so when you think gospel, they're not, you know, it's not like Luke where you have 24 chapters of minute detail about every single thing he ever saw. Um, they, a lot of them are very short, and, and it, you just just scan through a couple of them, find, you know, find them online, and all you need to do is read them, and you'll see that, that they're trying to replicate the gospel format, to pre, but to present a radically different message. So the Gospel of Peter, for example, claims to reveal secret teachings of Jesus that nobody else knows about. It's obvious that it's a response to the true gospels trying to get people to disbelieve them, right? Because that's what we do, right? It's, it goes, it goes from, you know, the gospel of Peter to um, Joseph Smith with the book of Mormon. We, we, we cl- there's something in our hearts that craves to be part of the in crowd, the crowd that has the secret knowledge, right? It's, it's, and at a certain point, we see this also with, I, I believe, and I, I don't want, I'm trying not to step on any toes, but I'm try, trying to be careful, but, but I'm honest, is I believe that's part and parcel of the popularity of the Jesus tourism movement, right? The books that I died, I went to heaven, and I came back. And I remember Kevin DeYoung at a conference saying once, he said, you know, Scripture tells us about heaven, but it's almost as if sometimes that's not enough. We don't want to just hear from the person who created it. Maybe if someone went there and came back and could tell us. But are those claims authoritative? Well, I hope they're not because oftentimes they're contradictory, right? You know, the, the, you know some people have come back and claimed that you get a second chance at salvation when, after you die. Well, I'm not willing to peg my eternal soul or the soul of my children on that claim. Like if they, I, I've read that it is a point when a man wants to die and then the judgment, right? And so, so I think we need to be very, very careful that that, that that inner desire that oftentimes we have to be part of the in-group, to attain to secret knowledge, something to be part of the special club, right? That is, is, is higher and deeper and better, um, that that doesn't lead us down a path of error. Um, only a book that came many years after the real gospels would make a claim like that. So uh, let me see, make sure we got through our notes here. Distinction between accepting a book's authority, um, non-biblical books present radically different messages, and then early believers didn't choose books, but received or inherited them. And that's really the third 
the third idea there is, as Christians, we ultimately affirm that Scripture is self-authenticating. Okay? And I will be first to admit that, that there is a rather circular argument there. Okay? Why do I believe that this is the Word of God? Because it claims to be the Word of God. Okay? And that it has been proven true over and over again. So, our, so you, you read something like Joshua McDowell's um, Evidence That Demands a Verdict. Okay? Does he come up with a lot of proofs that show that Scripture is true? I would say yes. However, I would also say that if none of those proofs existed, that we as Christians would still call to be, be believe that this is true because Scripture is self-authenticating. Um, an example of what I do in apologetics class, Scripture never tries to prove the existence of God. Why is that? Why does Scripture never try to prove that God exists? I'm not saying we shouldn't use you know, arguments for the existence of God, the cosmological argument, the ontological argument. I think they can be helpful. But Scripture, no, you, can't, you can't get those from Scripture because they're not there. Why does Scripture not seek to prove the existence of God? Okay, uh, maybe. What is, Paul, what is Paul's whole argument in, Re- in Romans 1? It's self-evident that everyone knows there's a God. In fact, I, I had a Bible college president say once, there, there's no such thing as atheists, there's only people who are angry at God. And I, I think that's somewhat true. Is, is we, I mean, think about it. The very term that we use, I gotta pull my phone up because my watch died. <laughs> so I'm gonna put that right there. Um, the very term we use, atheist, no God involves the name of the very person that we're denying exists. It would be like if we if we didn't want if we if we decided there were no Karens in the world and we we were, we were part of the A Karen Club. It's like, but you're using the name of the person that doesn't exist in your your title for it, and it, it's 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 a, it's a weird this weird dynamic um, where we're going to deny the existence of someone but use their name and and then it's just I don't know I find it to be kind of odd, but Scripture is. Self-authenticating. It affirms, it testifies to its old, own truthfulness. Yes, okay, we don't want to deny this. We can demonstrate its accuracy by corroborating with other historical sources. And every time, archaeology and other places, over and over again, we're finding that Scripture is true. That, that these civilizations of the Old Testament existed. That, that you know, and, and, it's, and for years, like, well, the Philistines didn't exist. There's no record of the Philistines until they do. <laughs> And, and it's just it's just incredible to, to see how that, that help happens over and over and over again. By the end of the day, the Christian receives Scripture as the Word of God because the Holy Spirit who inspired it testifies to the believer that it is true. Uh, Jesus, speaking of himself as the Good Shepherd in John 10, 4, said this. He said, the sheep follow him for they know his voice. And so the, the point that I, that, that I want to make in closing on that, on that part there is that these early believers were not putting themselves in a place of judgment over books. In other words, they weren't choosing. They weren't like, well, we got 55 letters from Paul. Let's pick the best 13 we can find and put them into the, the New Testament. They, they were looking at the, the list of 75 gospels they had and trying to find the ones that best fit their own male chauvinistic theology and, and put them together. They were recognizing something that had been accepted by the church, that had been confirmed by the Spirit, and that was borne out by history. And then there was four, there's four things I'm going to talk about here in, in just a second. So, so I, but the big point there is that difference between choosing and receiving and inheriting. Does that, does that make sense? There's a big difference there. Um, I, I, don't, I didn't get to pick my kids. Um, God gave them to me, right? Uh, you don't, and so you don't, we don't go to Kids Are Us. Like we always joke with our kids, right? That, you know, is, is it too late to return you to Kids Are Us? You know, we sell the receipt. You know, and, and you know, it's, it's just a joke, right? Because they're ours. Like, they're, we're passionately in love with our children. But at the same time, we didn't go and choose them somewhere. You know, God, God sends you the ones you have, and we, we recognize them as our, as our own. So but before we take it, we'll, we'll open up for questions here in just a second. But I want to I get through C&D, and then we'll kind of, as we put a, put a wrap on, on canon, we'll, uh, we'll open it up for conversation. So letter C, then, are the criteria for canonical books. So as they, as they were looking for this, they, you know, they're wrestling through, how do we accept this? They're not going to do it blindly. They're not going to be like, oh, well, any book that claims to be part of the Bible, we'll just throw into the mix, right? It's like Golden Corral, you know? We'll add a little, little pot roast over here, a little corn over here, a little mashed potatoes, and anyone that's in the salad, we'll put that over there. You know, and there's, there's, you know, we'll, just, we'll just kind of mix it all up. No, there's, there's some criteria that were met. And the first one was, <laughs> and I was mispronounced the word, um, uh, apostolicity, right? So apostle, so it's A-P-O-S-T-O-L-I 
CIT while I'll spell it again, because I again, it's not a word that I'm, I don't use it in my regular daily uh, conversations with people. So, um, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to spell it again. A-P-O-S-T-O-L-I-C-I-T-Y. And, and yes, you, as, as you get older, you find there's certain words that, that leave your tongue a little twisted and then certain sounds that go together. And, and, when, and no matter how many times you, you have it in your head, this is, this is it, this is it. As soon as it comes out of your mouth, you're like, no, that was, that was a fail. That was, that was not. <laughs> and, so, and so what we mean by that is, was it written by an apostle or someone with immediate contact with an apostle? And that's just the first. It's, it's, it was first, one of the first criteria the early church was looking at as can we recognize this as authoritative? So you think of um, you know, what, books of, what books of the New Testament were written by apostles? Just give me a couple. Okay, Gospel of John. Okay, Matthew, Gospel of Matthew. Yeah, first, second, third, John. There we go. Anything written by Paul? Okay, any? Okay. So Revelation, you know, we, uh, we, have, we have a pretty good group there. The book of Acts, or not, not book of Acts, that's Luke, but we're, we're going to talk about him in just a second. Um, anything else? I think on top of my head. We said, Matt, yeah, we, we got Matthew and John. So we have Matthew, John, and Paul. Those are your big, your big names when it comes to apostles. But you think about, and then also the early church recognized that Mark, um, was connected heavily with Peter. That we, there, there's a, a strong belief in church tradition that, that, that Peter was the source of much of Mark's source material for his, his gospel. There's a relationship that exists there, um, that Mark got there. And Luke, um, strongly connected with, with Paul. Okay? Um, in fact, there's a really cool uh, movie that was made. I'm trying to remember what it was called. Testament. So if you're into The Chosen, like if you're the, the Chosen show that's been on, which my family has been watching pretty, pretty consistently, and on that same, so we use a Roku a streaming, we have a smart TV, and that's how we get our, we don't subscribe to any kind of um, like over-the-air broadcasting. And so we, we use Roku, and on that same channel, which is the Vision, I think it's Angel Studios, Angel, the Angel Studios channel on there, is they have some other projects that they're working on. And one of those was this movie they worked on that they hope is the forerunner to a TV series called um, Testament. And what it does is it takes, it takes Luke and the apostles and puts them in like 2023. So think 2023 city, Luke and the apostles, Jesus has just died, resurrected, spent his time on earth and has ascended to the father. And now the early church is, is spreading the gospel. And it's really a cool concept because you've got this, this young doctor, Luke, who is trying to begin to write down some of the things he's seen. So he's talking to Peter and he's getting some of the stories that Peter had. He, meanwhile, they're on the, they're, they're running from, because there's persecution and, you know, things and, and they're retelling some of the parables. It's really, it's really kind of neat. It's available for free online and um, it, it's worth taking a look at. I, I think they mess up one of the parables, but, but for the most part, they, it's, it's kind of a, a fascinating take on, on the early um, church and how, how Acts, you know, how Acts began. So kind of a neat thing there. So Luke is associated with Paul. Um, Jude was accepted. Why? Why would we accept Jude? Yeah, he's a, he's a brother of Jesus, which is odd because Jude doesn't introduce himself that way, does he? How does he introduce himself? Yeah, a servant, a doulos. He says, I'm a, I'm a servant or a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ because in his mind, that was a far greater title than I was the half-brother of Jesus. You know, you never see him throwing his weight around, right? Like, you know, I mean, just in case you, you, you wondered, I grew up with a guy, you know. I mean, I didn't accept him as Savior until after his death, burial, and resurrection, at least from what we understand from, <laughs> from Scripture. But, but you know, we, there, there is that. Um, and then Hebrews, Hebrews was probably the hardest one, but Hebrews was ultimately accepted for its intrinsic qualities. It, it seems to be, even though we don't know who wrote it, 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 match, it meshes perfectly with the theology of the New Testament, especially in how the writer is taking the forms and features of the Old Testament and showing how they, have, they are now fulfilled in Christ and in the, new, in the New Testament, okay? So the first criterion was that word. Um, second was antiquity. Antiquity, and that's A-N-T-I-Q-I-T-Y. So A-N-T-I-N-T-I-Q-I-T-Y. -q -i T-Y. Um, so even if someone tried to slap an apostle's name on a book, the book had to be known to originate from the time of the apostles. This is what eliminated so many of the later gospels and Gnostic writings. Many of them came, you know, decades, if not hundreds of years after the time of the apostles. And so, um, you know, so you think of like things like pseudo Barnabas and, and things like that. And it's like written years and years after Barnabas ever lived and, and really in no way connected to him other than someone slapped his name on, on it. Um, number three, the third was conformity to the rule of faith. Conformity to the rule of faith, or what we would call orthodoxy. 
In other words, so we have the Old Testament scriptures. The Old Testament is established. And now we have Christ. And, and, and as, as books are recognized as authoritative and clearly accepted by the church, like Romans. Romans, no one really ever argued about Romans. And yet Romans is a little bit controversial. I mean, you know, Romans 6 through 8. I mean, how many people have, like, how many churches have gotten to fighting matches over, you know, over, you know, 6 through 8, 9 through 11? You know, Jacob have I loved, or Esau, you know, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated? And, I mean, you know, how, you know, how, do, we, how do we wrestle through this? And yet, you know, and so they began to look and say, is there, is there consistent doctrine from book to book to book? You know, is it, is it consistent with the, the flow of doctrine and the rest? Does, does it match the rule of faith? And so you think of, like, the Gospel of Judas, that um, supposedly shares stories from Jesus' childhood. And it shows a Jesus who is very arbitrary. You know, you, you, you mess with him and he strikes you dead. Um, and, that's, and yet he would heal a bird. You know, you have a dead bird that he puts in his hand and he, he heals the bird and the bird flies away, but some kids make fun of him and he, he kills them. And you're like, all in the name of divine judgment. You know, and I, I, that just doesn't, besides all the other issues with the book, that doesn't match what we see in the in the text. The, the flow of the flow of the theology of it just really doesn't doesn't fit. Um, what do you think of? There's a couple of illustrations here. Uh, let's see here. It's easy to see why a book like the so-called Gospel of Thomas failed the test. Um, in the Gospel of Thomas, Jesus says that he will make Mary a male because women can only enter the kingdom of heaven if they become male. So that, I mean, that right there, you're looking at it going, I, I don't, mm, I don't, I don't, I don't think that fits. I, don't, I mean. Um, that's totally contradictory to what Paul says about male and female. Inheriting the kingdom in Galatians, one of the earliest biblical books written. Okay? And so the fourth characteristic um, was universality. Okay, universality. So universal, and then I-T-Y at the end. Universality. That is widespread and continuous usage by the churches across the known world. Uh, what's remarkable from a human perspective is there really was so much agreement on so many books so quickly. I mean, you think about the speed. They don't have email. It's not like they're, they're posting things to Google Docs, right, or whatever, whatever your company uses for sharing, you know, shared files. Like, they're not just uploading them and being like, hey, what do you guys think about this? Like, you know, to, to make it from Ephesus to, you know, to Rome, to Galatia, and to all these different cities where these, these letters had to end up, you're talking about time. And yet, so quickly, relatively speaking, Church leaders and church fathers are accepting these as, as authoritative. And part of that is just the, 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 the idea that was the inerrancy, the, the, the tradition passed down from the apostles to their early followers and then, and then accepted from there. Uh, so then two, uh, two final things here, and we'll see if there's any, uh, any conversations. Then we get to what I'm hoping to spend, to, I'm hoping to have time to finish up on because I think the more applicational at the end here. So two implications of this. Number one, the church did not create the Bible by its authority. Or just simply, the church didn't create the Bible. We did not make the Bible. Okay, that's, we, uh, it's in all of our founding documents, and I've read, I've read this church's constitution and doctrinal statements, and I'm pretty sure it's there as well, that we believe the scripture is the authoritative word of God. We place ourselves under scripture. Okay, it would be contradictory to our faith to say that we created the Bible and then placed ourselves under it. That's dumb. That'd be like saying, I, I birthed my children and now I will place myself under their authority. It doesn't work. That's the other way around. You create it, you're over it, okay? That's one of the arguments God makes in creation. He made us, therefore he is sovereign over, <laughs> over us, okay? The church did not make the Bible. Um, and therefore, uh, the canon is closed. Uh, I'm gonna make that, I'm, I'm gonna argue that an implication of all of this is that the canon is closed. Okay, and here's, let me read this paragraph so I don't, so don't miss, miss anything here. Um, we're not surprised that the canon closed with the passing of Christ and the apostles. In the same way it closed with the end of the Old Testament prophetic era in anticipation of Christ, so it closed with the passing of Christ as we now await his return. The Old Testament in passages like Malachi 4 and Deuteronomy 18 indicated that there was more prophecy to come. You know, Malachi 4 indicated that, that someone was going to come with the spirit of Elijah. There's going to be more, someone who will speak on God's behalf. There is something else coming. Deuteronomy, I will send a prophet like Moses, but, but like the better Moses. Like, you're going to listen to him, and he, you're going to follow him. But the New Testament now doesn't give us any expectation of more revelation. Paul says in Ephesians 2, the church is built on the foundation of the apostles, the New Testament, and the prophets, the Old Testament. We need no more and should expect no more. We can trust the word that we've received and we should praise God for how he has shined his light into our darkness 
and brought us this word that we hadn't deserved to know. In Hebrews 1, 1 and 2, the contrast before the former speaking of old by prophets and the recent speaking of in these last days suggests that God's speech by, to us by his son is the culmination of his speaking to mankind and is his greatest and final revelation to mankind in this period of redemptive history. And that's from Wayne, Wayne Grudem. And I, I, I'm very comfortable um, arguing that the implication of all that we know about this text is that the canon of Scripture is, is closed. That there is no further revelation. We've had, we had a conversation about that. I don't think it was, I don't think it was last time. I think it was the time, time before um, about, hey, you know, God, as, as God reveals himself to people, what that looks like. But any, any thoughts or comments just on canon of the text before we try to finish out with some of these practical ramifications of this? Questions, comments, concerns, throwing things. We accept all of them. Yeah, no, I agree. I think, I think that that runs deep in the human heart. We all want to, to come up with that new thing. And I think that goes back to, like I said, the the, the prophecy conferences of my childhood, um, with guys who knew that the rapture was coming right around the corner because you already have the red heifer in Israel ready to go. I'm sorry, that heifer died years ago. Like, <laughs> like it's like it's it, it doesn't really matter if the heifer's there because you could have all of Jerusalem destroyed, rebuilt. Before, like, like we don't, we don't know. Like, we just, we just have, no, we, we have no clue what the future looks like. And, and you know, we, we look at the Revelation, and many people have mentioned that you, you can't find any implication in Revelation of the United States. And, and, and obviously, we people assume that's because the United States has been wiped off the map somehow, or, or, or has ceased to be a, a world power. And that, that could be true. Um, I, I think it could also be true that God sends revival and great awakening again and that you have a mass turning to Christ so that when the rapture occurs, the United States does, for all intents and purposes, practically cease to exist. Because <laughs> if, if you actually end up truly with a massive percentage of any population of a country saved when the rapture occurs, that country will be decimated by default. And I don't know which is true. I mean, obviously, we look at the, the decline of our nation, but, but, I mean, you think of the time of Jonathan Edwards during the Great Awakening, and the, the pulpits were filled with lost pastors. I mean... You had, you had churches filled of, of people who weren't even saved because they, they were, they were in, you know, brought into the church as infants. Um, they weren't Christians. And, and people thought that, was, I mean, that could have been the end of the world is because there's just this moral degradation in the church. Um, and God, God, God can speak into that. And I, I think he can change the way we see our world here. I think that um, you know, persecution and, and uh, the general culture we find ourselves in is not... It's not exciting. You know, we don't wake up in the morning thinking, man, I wonder how someone's going to like spit on my faith today. So, you know, let's, let's see what's going to happen. But, but I do think it's good for us because it forces us to refine our ideas, to refine our arguments. It forces us to ask ourselves the hard questions of when it's no longer culturally acceptable to be who I claim to be, will I continue to claim to be that? Or will I, as many have, walk away? And I think COVID provided a really comfortable means for people who are already uncomfortable with the with the the calling, the sacrificial life that is that we're called to, to simply drop off and, and not and not return. And I'm not saying all of them are in that category, but I think when, when you're seeing across the board in American evangelical churches a percentage prior to COVID and a percentage after COVID, I don't think that, that you can simply plug in, well, it was COVID. Like I, I don't think at a certain point COVID is not going to permanently keep this many Christians away from, from gathering and fellowshipping with, with other believers. Um, but I don't think it's just that. I think there's other things. You know, we're, we're um, the way the church is handling uh, things like um, the, the transgender and sexuality issues in the church and uh, not, being, not being a clear, you know, when the trumpet sounds indistinctly, who, who goes to war, right? <laughs> if, you know, if, the, if the pastors are standing up and being wishy-washy on certain things, I do think there's people who are going to be like, what, what, what am I, 
what am I, what am I doing this for? What am I, uh, why am I risking my career, my job, um, if, if we're going to, if we're going to hedge on the truth? Um, so I think there's some of that. Anything else? We have about 10 minutes here. All right, I want to get through as many of these as I can, and we'll stop for any comments or questions after each one. So I want to talk about attributes of Scripture. <clears throat> attributes of Scripture, that's uh, Roman numeral number two, and these are, these are designed to be applicational. In other words, so okay, so like, okay, so we talked about the canon of Scripture, we talked about earlier about the authority of Scripture. How do I take this home? So first of all, letter A, uh, these six attributes. Letter A, divine inspiration, the divine inspiration of Scripture. And what do we mean by that? Scripture is God's word. Okay, um, I'd like two volunteers, one to turn to 2 Timothy 3.16 and one to get 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. So uh, volunteer for 2 Timothy 3.16, Ian, um, and Gary, could you get uh, 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21? And Ian, as soon as you get there, you can go ahead and 2 Timothy 3. These are familiar texts, but I think just a reminder, good reminder for us. Second Timothy three sixteen. Second Timothy. Yep, Second Timothy three. 16. Go ahead, nice and loud. And then read 17 as well. Okay, thank you. And then 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. Okay, so it's, it's kind of simple as this. What Scripture says, God says. When we, when we you know, the, the idea of breathed out, theops neustos, is this idea that, that God breathed out the very words of Scripture. And it doesn't mean that God obliterated the personality or will of the writer. I mean, if you, you don't have to know Hebrew. You don't have to know Hebrew or Greek to, to read Luke, Paul, and John, and Peter, and realize that there's differences. Paul's the only one that write, writes massive run-on sentences. Right and and then Peter, there there very much is a tinge of his fisherman background in there. He he writes simply. He he does not use the complex language that some of the other the other authors use. Um, John also John is more. Uh, I would almost say John is like man of the people language. Like he he is writing the epitome of koine. Like he is he's just writing in a way that appeals to to a broad selection of people who understand the language he, he's writing in, and so their personalities bleed through. Paul's irony. Right? You know, he's writing to Corinthians, I wish that I was a super apostle like you, right? Like, and you, you, that, that, I hate to say holy sarcasm because I think um, we very rarely are able to use sarcasm in a holy fashion. It's pretty much always a sinful fashion when we, when we use it. But, but it, the personality bleeds through the page. Um, it doesn't require us to take a dictation view of the Bible where men became mere robots or marionettes. Um, King David, Apostle Paul have their own personalities and styles, and God, through his, his own providential, and supernatural activity works within each author to ensure that what they write is his word. And so why does this doctrine matter? Okay, why does this implication matter? And I think we'll probably end, actually end up finishing on this one um, because I think it's, it's a good way for us to, to close and then spend the, the next time on the next ones. Um, if the Bible is of human origin, it can always be improved, right? Anything that is strictly designed and created by a man can be improved. You know, you think about um, our, it, it's the company I work for, we have, we created and built the website that the state of Delaware uses to submit all of their, their Medicaid claims, okay? And every, I think it's once a month on a Sunday night, we have a release window in which the newest version of this is released. And then we wait because no, no matter how many environments we take it through, something's going to break because it's built by humans and it's technology and it's fickle. Um, and I still don't understand all of that because I'm not a developer. 
Uh, but you know that someone put something in there that didn't get caught in the lower environments, and they're gonna put it into production, and next day, on the help desk, we're gonna get client, we're gonna get things from the state, and they're gonna be like, we can't submit this, this button doesn't work anymore. We're like, well, we gotta go back and fix it, why? Because it's made by humans. And as, as, as careful as we try to be, the, the process can always be improved. We're always gonna find things that slip through the cracks. There's gonna be errors that were there. The Bible, in essence, if written by humans only, would evolve with the times. But if it's of divine origin, then this, this document, this book, is timeless. It is for all people of all places, of all times, and of all cultures. It stands over us as our judge and not the other way around. We need to repent of our tendency to obey Scripture only when it seems reasonable or culturally acceptable. I think we see that now. We are the, One of the, the points we'll make later in this study as we wrap it up is I believe the battle of our day is the sufficiency of Scripture. Is Scripture sufficient? Is it sufficient to speak to gender roles? Is it, is it sufficient to speak to gender identity? Is it sufficient to speak to sexual appetites and sexual um, expressions in society? Is it sufficient to speak to people struggling with anxiety? Specific things that scripture deals with. And what we're going to constantly come back to is, do we believe that it's authoritative and sufficient? Or do we simply believe that it's something that it's nice to have for like the big things? Like, am I going to heaven? But it doesn't speak really genuinely to how I parent my kids or how I love my wife or how I interact with my family at home. So how do we apply this? And I, I put it in your notes there. How to respond to this is very simply learn the whole Bible. Uh, God didn't inspire just parts of it. And not just the most famous bits or the sections that seem most relevant to us, but all of it. You know, can you, can you summarize, like if I were to say, hey, in 30 seconds or less, summarize the message of the book of Judges. I mean, what, what, how, how would we answer that question? Summarize the book of Judges. You know, we probably don't spend a ton of our devotional time in Judges. But if I said Leviticus, that would be even worse. Um, but, you know, we, we, Judges says a lot about the human condition, the human heart, and who we are when left out, you know, when, when, when we abandon following Yahweh and, and our tendencies in those moments. And then you know, oftentimes we're looking at our lives going, man, how did I do that? Like, how did I fall that far that fast? Well, Judges has a lot to say about that right? I mean, judges went from, we're simply not obeying the God that led us out of, out of Egypt, to we're chopping up a concubine into 12 pieces and mailing her body parts to the 12 tribes of Israel. Like, how did you get there? How, do you, how did you find yourself in this place at this time? Well, it didn't happen overnight. It happened over this period of, 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 ish, of, of years, as you have this decline within the society of people who are, are turning to God, but not turning in full repentance with full hearts. There's a lot of lessons in the book of Judges. What about Nahum? What's the message of the book of Nahum? That's, I mean, that's, you know, or, or, or the book of Hezekiah. Some of you, some of you caught that. There is no, no book of Hezekiah. But, you know, um, it reminds me of a pastor a number of years ago who he, he was getting discouraged. And I don't know if this was the way to, to fix his discouragement, but he was getting discouraged because he felt like people were just telling him what he wanted to hear in his congregation. And so he, he stood up one Sunday and he said, I, I, uh, for next Sunday, we're going to study Mark 17, and I want you all to read Mark 17. Okay? And so everyone left and then came back the next week. And, and he got up to preach and he said, Have you, um, how many of you read Mark 17 this week? And obviously, you got a lot of people who are not being very honest. They raised their hands. And he said, there is no Mark 17, and now we're going to address our subject of the day, which is honesty. Um, and so, you know, maybe not the best way to make your point, uh, because everyone now is looking around. You probably lost some people from your church at that point. Not, you know, but it does, it does go back to this idea that, man, um, we need to be passionate about this book. You know, as men, uh, we need to point our families back to this book. When our kids are struggling, when our wives are struggling, and I know we, we've talked to some of you, and we've talked to some of your, your spouses, and, and, and some, you know, there's, 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 this church has gone through a lot right? It's a lot, there's a lot of members of this church that are wrestling through a lot of stuff. And, and we need to stay away from that whole mentality of quote them three Bible verses and check in with them in the morning. But it's, it's this idea of a partnership, right? I'm going to take you by the hand 
And then I'm going to put this in both of our hands, and together we're going to walk through this. And we're not leaving until it's done. And, and it may not be done till glory, right? We, we want the quick fix. We want the instant oatmeal, instant pudding, instant popcorn. It may be a lifelong thing. You know, you, you think of, of just some of the events that, that, that folks in this family have gone through, losing family members and things. And some of that, that's going to be a ham to walk through the rest of your life with you over this. Because that's never going to just disappear. Like it's never going to just get better. It doesn't. Some of you, you have kids walk away from the faith or um, kids who have entered into marriages that are just awful. And, and you're like trying to figure out like, what do I, what, what, what do, I do? And um, it, it, you need brothers and sisters to walk with you with this. But, but it starts with us going to our families and being like, hey, I may not be the sharpest tool in the shed, but I, but I know where there's a lot of wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> like, I know there's a lot of goodness and a lot of authority and a lot of truth. And I know that if we follow this, God has not promised us an easy path. He never does. But he has promised us a path that exists under his blessing and under his guidance. And even if that, if that then means that I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, the add-on to that is I will fear no evil because he is with me. And when God is with us, no matter how dark the day looks and no matter how challenging the situation may be, we know that on the end of it lies our good and his glory. And that's, that's, that's worth it. Like that's, that, that, that adds meaning to every aspect of our lives and every dimension of them. So I want to pause there. Any, any comments or questions as we, as we wrap up? I'll share one tidbit and I'll pray and we'll we'll dismiss. So one of um, this is not original to me. Something I started years ago in college. When I was in college, we had to take a class on First Corinthians, and it was just it was an it was an English book study of First Corinthians. And the teacher, the professor, made us learn um, what he called popcorn summaries of each chap- chapter of First Corinthians. And some of those have not stuck with me. Some of them have. But it's become kind of something in my own mind as I'm doing my own personal Bible reading, kind of falling under this point of application of know the whole Bible. Is so if I spend spend time reading, you know, in Judges, getting a general idea in my head of Judges one, and here is a one sentence summary of everything that happens in in Judges one. Right? You think of like I'm reading through Joshua right now. Um, Joshua one. You know, Moses has died. God calls Joshua into leadership to lead the people into the land of Canaan, promising to be with him in the same way that he was with Moses. Yeah, that's, not hard to, that's not hard to remember, but, but now that, that kind of gets burned in your mind. Like Joshua 1, this is what happens in Joshua 1. And Joshua 2, they send the spies out to Jericho and Rahab. You know, and you see this beautiful picture of this prostitute who, who houses these men. Why? Because she's heard that the God of Israel is a great God who does really incredible things on behalf of his people. And, you know, and, and, and then you go to Joshua 3 and 4, and um, you go from there. And it... It helps us to, to stick things in our brain a little bit, especially, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm 43, but I'm quickly hitting that point where there's so much going on in life that, that sometimes things can go in and fall out. <laughs> and, and it's just, things are getting filtered out sometimes with, with five kids and life going on. And um, I, I grasp any tool that I can think of to help me remember what's going on in the text, what's going on in scripture, and, and, and what ammunition am I giving the Holy Spirit to bring things to mind that I've studied as I'm in particular situations that require wisdom, okay? So I just thought I'd pass that, pass that along. All right, let's pray, and then um, we, can, uh, we can head out from here. Father, we're so grateful for your word. Uh, it, is, um, it is a light to our path in a very dark world. It gives us grace when we fall. It gives us wisdom when we just don't know what to do. It defies our human intelligence and promotes the weak things and the foolish things of the world to confound the strong and the things that are mighty. It points out that there is a God in heaven who created all things, and yet also tells us that the Holy Spirit must open our eyes to the validity of much of the truth that we see exposed in its pages. We see practical wisdom for how to be godly fathers and mothers and husbands and wives and children and parents and employers and employees And we see divine authority claimed over the life of every human being on planet Earth. We see principles that speak to the the issues of our day. Is an embryo a human being? Does a fetus deserve protection? Is a baby 
truly a human being? Is my identity wrapped up in what I feel like today, or is it wrapped up in who you created me to be when you knitted me together in the womb? There is so much that Scripture speaks to. And Lord, I pray for, um, for CBC, Tunkhannock, that this would be a church full of men and women, boys and girls, who would unify around the importance of the text. I thank you even for the blessing that was prayed this morning at lunch um, over the couple getting married and that it was not a, a blessing of good wishes and high hopes, but that the text of scripture was prayed as a desire over two people uniting themselves in marriage. And Lord, I ask that for this church, that as we think of the struggles and challenges that different members face, that the prayers of our hearts as we, as we go to prayer at different moments of the day would be filled with the text and that your Holy Spirit then would act on our behalf that you would give comfort where there is comfort, that you would bring healing where healing is needed, that you would bring restoration where restoration is needed, that you would provide grace and abundance to those who are struggling. And Lord, that that would, that would be a mark of this church that, that just never stops because your word is that valuable. We love you. Thank you for these men and, and women in the other room who came out tonight after a long day, um, looking forward to a busy week, uh, all the things they have on their plates tomorrow, to simply talk about the Bible and what it means, and how to apply it, and how much we love it, and how much we want to live under it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.